I'm uh, Kim Cups. I'm the Livermore Computing Division Leader at Lawrence Livermore National Lab. And I think several people, I, I know for sure that a guy named Tom Slazak came and talked to you uh, earlier this year about some bioinformatics stuff that he works on at the lab. And I want to tell you that, you know, my motivation in coming here is, is, is to get you guys interested in working for the lab. All right, we uh, love bright computer scientists and uh, we hire all the time, okay? So today, I'm going to talk to you about a little bit about the lab, a uh, little bit about Livermore Computing, which is the organization that I run, I talk to you about the third uh, fastest machine in the world, which sits on our floor, it's called Sequoia, and the challenges that we had in integrating it. I uh, have a degree from Chico, a uh, bachelor's in applied math with a computer science minor and a, and a master's in computer science, and went to UC Davis for a PhD and on the laboratory campus, completed the coursework, took the test, and said, I think I'll work at the lab. So I did, I did not get the PhD. And many of the people who work for me have bachelor's degrees in computer science and are top-notch uh, software developers, <coughs> system administrators. It's, it's, it's a great place to work. After I talk to you about Sequoia, I'll talk to you about some things that we enable with HPC and HPC going forward. So first of all, Lawrence Livermore Lab. It started in 1952 and it really was Edward Teller's way to do a hydrogen bomb, all right? There was the Manhattan Project in the 40s uh, that got started after Pearl Harbor was bombed. And the guy who did that was Oppenheimer. And he was a guy who said, fission is the way to go. And they did something called the atomic bomb. That was the thing we, we dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And Edward Teller said, you know, the minute the Russians tested their first bomb in 1949, he said, there's no way that we're going to stay ahead of the Russians with atomic bombs. We've got to go to hydrogen bombs. So in 1952, they gave him his own lab. It was in Livermore. It was with E.O. Lawrence, a researcher from Berkeley. And off they went. And today, the bombs that are in the stockpile are hydrogen bombs. And that's based on fusion, which is pushing things together at high heat and temperature versus fission, which is taking really heavy uh, nuclei and breaking them apart with neutrons, okay? So, stockpile stewardship is the main funder of our simulation program. Uh, high performance computing is a core competency at the lab. It's one of the, it's just really one of the great places to work. I used to work in the, in the laser program, first seven years I was there, best thing I ever did go to high performance computing. We work with everybody across the lab to do simulations. And although we're, we're funded by stockpile stewardship primarily, we work on problems in basic science, material science, uh, climate modeling. These machines are used to do incredible things and I'll show you some of them near the end of the talk. And I'm hoping that uh, Dr. Ledden is, is nice enough to let me know, you know, when, when it's getting close. I have no uh, concept of time in this room. I'm told this clock is meaningless. Five megabyte hard drive coming off the plane going to our lab. So this is how it used to be guys before you and I existed. <coughs> HPC, one of the things you should understand about HPC is that it's critical to assuring our national security Every year, the directors of the three national labs, Los Alamos, Lawrence Livermore, and Sandia, sign something that they give to the president, a letter to the president, and they say, our stockpile is safe and secure. Well, how do they do that? They run, they used to do underground testing, which in 1992, we decided to follow the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty. We never signed it, but we've never done an underground test of a nuclear weapon again. And we are assuring the safety and security of our stockpile through massive simulation and experiment. And then looking at the models we're running on these computers and these experiments with, with out nuclear material, obviously, that are contained and small and looking at a part of the physics, not the entire explosion, uh, are used to verify the models. Okay, They're, these machines are also used to do conventional weapons, make, 
uh, try and figure out whether what we just saw was an earthquake or, a, or an underground test by another country. Uh, and a bunch of other, other stuff that I've talked about. Drug design I'll talk about later. The, the takeaway on this slide is that the, a sustained commitment to improve HPC is essential to our economic security. And the tie in there is if you don't have good national security, you, if, if you don't have good economic security, if you're not strong economically, you're going to be a weak country, all right? You're not, you're going to be, if you don't have good national security, you're also going to be a weak country. So those things are very related. All right, I told you, look, this is number of nuclear tests on the left, on the red line, left-hand axis, and along the bottom, this is kind of an eye chart, is time. 1992 is right here. And the, on the right is a long plot of processor power. And you can see that when we stopped nuclear testing in 1992, high performance computing took off, all right? Now that's a combination of two things. One, we needed 3D fidelity now. We didn't need that before. We could see if these bombs work by testing them underground. Now we need really, really good models, all right, with high fidelity. You need more capable computers uh, than we have today to do some of the things. There are still things we don't understand about the physics uh, in these bombs and in, you know, in, in uh, laser plasma interaction for the National Ignition Facility when you're looking at creating energy, all right, out of fusion. So this change in our posture led to this explosion. And our, we partnered very heavily with vendors to create these machines, both the hardware and the software for these machines. And you guys know about Moore's Law, I hope, that, you know, processing power. In 1965, he said processing power would double every year. In 1975, he said it'll double every two years. Well, we're looking at the end of Moore's Law now, and, you know, the chips are getting so small and so hot, and we're packing the, tr the transistors in. It's, it's coming to an end. So that's your background on the lab and high performance computing and how it came to be. And now I tell you about the computing center at the lab. There are 6,000 people there. And we have about 3,000 active users. They aren't all on site. Many of them are. We have two basic, we have more than two domains, but we just talk about two of them, uh, classified and unclassified. We have remote users on our unclassified computers from all over the country. Uh, you have, the only rule is you have to have a collaborator who's, the princip who's a, one of the principal investigators that is a lab employee. And then you, if you get one of those, you can get access to what are really incredible resources. We have a number of parallel clusters, serial clusters, viz clusters, uh, many different kinds of interconnects, large parallel file systems that run an open source uh, software on them called Lustre that we're a big part of developing in, in the community. We're very uh, open source shop. So what else can I tell you? We used to have five buildings. We just shut two down. We now have three. Uh, the biggest one is the one that I work in and it's got 48,000 square feet of clear span space which means it doesn't have any of those sitting in the middle of it. See that big tower in the middle of your room? Lots of computer rooms have those big blocks there so that they have power sitting there or they have, you put crack units on the floor. We don't have any of that. It all comes from underneath the floor. So 17 feet below, you have 32 air handlers that blow at 80,000 cubic feet per minute. They're, it's a massive amount of air. You stand in front of them, you know, you're in a, like a wind tunnel. And we have a uh, bunch, what, 30 megawatts in that facility of power, which would power 30,000 homes. Okay, that's a, lot of, that's a lot of power. This is our eye chart. This just tells you, look, we got a lot of systems. And we leverage commodity and open source with targeted development and collaboration efforts. If, if you work for Livermore Computing, you can develop uh, archival storage software, uh, Linux kernel mods that run clusters on something called the TriLab operating system software, which we developed uh, on top of Red Hat Enterprise Linux. We strip out about a third of Red Hat Enterprise Linux, and then we add in a bunch of custom stuff to run clusters. Conman, Powerman, if you guys have heard of any of that stuff, that's all developed at Livermore. So we have been 
number one on the top 500 list, 11 out of 35 cycles. So about a third of the time in the past, in the last 17 and a half years, this list comes out twice a year, we've, been, we've had a number one machine. Which, so we're a leader in high performance computing. Uh, we are really, we have been leading the most. I'd love to say it's gonna continue. But that little two over there in the China category are the last two lists. And I don't see us catching China anytime soon. They are pouring massive amounts of money into their high performance computing uh, efforts. Uh, they're also, you know, we believe, I think we believe, well, I won't say this. I wonder why they're pouring massive amounts of money into their high performance computers in China. Uh, we, Intel was just told, by the way, by the Commerce Department, by the way, there you go, there it is, you cannot sell chips to China, all right? And the Tiane 2 has a bunch of Intel chips in it. So Intel's not very happy about that, as you can imagine, but there's something called export control in our country that says if people are using these for things that we think can be used against us, then we're not going to let an American company sell it. And I think it's a very fascinating uh, concept in the global world that we're living in. You know, it just, it, it's sort of mind-boggling. I just wonder how long that's really going to hold. Fascinating. Uh, you know, we're very, we partner with many, many different vendors to create the machines. And I'll talk to you about Sequoia, and I think you'll understand some of the partnering, and if you don't, ask me. On to Sequoia. First of all, I, I, a compute card is making its way around the room. Uh, it is a third generation IBM BlueGene platform. You may have heard of BlueGene L. It's pretty revolutionary when it was deployed at the laboratory in 2004. Was that right? Yeah, December 2004. I was the project leader on that installation. I was also the project leader for the uh, Sequoia procurement and, and integration. Really the highlight of my career was uh, putting this machine in. It was the hardest it was the most problematic integration I have ever encountered, and I learned so much about so many things that aren't computer science, you, you cannot believe it. Uh, and, and that's fun, because I've been doing computer science a long time. So it has a 20 petaflop per second target. So you guys, petaflop is 10 to the 15th. All right, the next thing after petaflops, they're exaflops, and they're 10 to the 18th. So this guy, if you took all 7.2 billion people on Earth, this, somebody says this, and my problem, 7.2 billion people on Earth, and you just start get up, giving a calculator, and you say, start doing stuff, it would take them 30 days to do what Sequoia does in one second. All 7.2 billion people. That's how big a number 20 petaflops per second is. It has 1.6 petabytes of memory. Every compute card has 16 cores on it, and if you multiply that across the 98,384 of those compute cards that is going around the room, uh, you get 1.6 million of these cores. It's got a 60 terabyte per second bisection bandwidth. It's a 5D torus. This thing is, it, it, really, it really hums. It was number one on the top 500. I got to go to Germany and accept an award for it and you know, talk about how cool it was. It was very neat. Uh, it, at, when it runs a LINPAC, which is the program that they use to decide how fast you are, Right? If you want to be number one, you have to run a LINPAC and you have to run it with good residuals and they say, okay, that's how fast your machine is and they come out with this top 500 list every June in Germany and every November in the United States, the supercomputing conference. This thing is 91% liquid cooled and 9% air cooled, became generally available, generally available for scientists on the classified side to use in July of 2013. This is how the water gets in, in and out of this thing. And when I talk about the problems we've had with this board, I won't talk about this problem, so let me talk about it now. Very early on, we found that we were just losing these boards like crazy, these compute nodes, right? They are failing. And it turns out that every single one of them was in this very forward position. This is the first failure. We had so many. But the, <laughs> And what it was is that the, it was the closest to the outlet water. It was too hot. Okay, so we increased the flow, and that just made the water move faster through the machine, and it stayed cool enough. So that was pretty, pretty cool. Literally. All right. Ha. Okay. 
this is a this is a unique packaging paradigm that that the blue jean folks used, uh, and we got a lot of flack in when we were putting our effort into this in the early 2000s. Uh, you know, people were not using these kinds of densely packed, huge multi-core solutions back in 2000 when we were talking to IBM about this. It was revolutionary in terms of how little power it used because it uses uh, low power cores, right? And the first one, Blue Genel, used a very uh, kind of a low power interconnect. So we, we got revolutionary power per watt out of this thing. So you get a chip, you put it on the module, you put it on the compute node, you put a bunch of memory all, all over the board, which adds up to 16 uh, gig per, 16 gig, one gig per core. You stick 32 of those in a node card, okay? So now remember your exponents, two to the fifth here, okay? Then you stick 32 of those into this rack. So that's two to the fifth times two to the fifth, and you add the exponents two to the tenth. This makes life simple, because now this thing is just a K. So if somebody says, how many nodes are in your system? You say, how many racks do I have? And you say, that many K, and that's how many nodes you have. So we have 96 racks. So we have 96 K of those compute nodes, and that's you know, times 1024, so you get 98,000 something. This is the chip. And you know, it's pretty amazing when you look at this thing in, in detail. Uh, there's 18, 18 cores on it. All right. We only use we use 16 of them. There are 16 available to the programmer. One of them is just for for yield, right? In case you got a bad core and you could just say, okay, let's just use this other one instead. And the 17th core is for communication on the chip. And they did that because they had too much OS noise uh, in Blue Gene L and Blue Gene P, which were the two generations before. And they said, let's offload that communication to a 17th processor on the on the on the chip itself and it really reduced the, uh, the OS noise. So that was a nice, uh, nice thing they did. The other thing I think is interesting is 1.47 billion transistors in this 45 nanometer technology. Wow. I mean, that's, that's Denard scaling, all right, is when you're just packing more and more transistors into it. And what, we're at the end of Denard scaling. Why? Because it just gets too hot and you go small enough and you start to not be able to control the current leakage. So that, that's a problem moving forward with our, you know, it's just, you just can't keep going indefinitely. That's, that's the point. We have to have new technology. Here's your compute card that you're uh, running around the room, I hope. It'll come back up here eventually. And that's the basic field replaceable unit in a blue gene node. Uh, we lose we have to go touch this machine, the MTBF, mean time between failure on this machine is about once every six days. George, what time is it? <laughs> it's 23 past 12. Thank you. Okay. Here's the thing that's right here. Okay. The fiber bundle, five detours. Okay. Uh, let's see. A, B, C, and D and E. E is inside the motherboard, all copper, all right? And if you come up here after I'm done talking, you'll see that there are eight fiber bundles that come into this little car here. Uh, a, it, a transmit, A receive, B transmit, B receive, C transmit, C receive, D transmit, D receive. So this 5D torus, uh, four dimensions of it go out to other places in the machine, and the fifth dimension is inside the board itself. And these other little four are the way that communication is done with what are called I.O. nodes. They're the air-cooled part of the system. And they sit in a top hat on top of the rack. And there are, that we use one I.O. node for every 128 of these. Okay, and, it, and they function ship the <coughs> I.O. to the I.O. nodes. And that makes you, it possible to use a heavyweight kernel, regular rel kernel in the I.O. nodes, heavyweight kernel, and a lightweight custom kernel in these compute nodes. Okay, so this is just, this is an old chart. IBM was very, it's an IBM chart. Thank you, IBM. And IBM was very proud of it, and rightly so. 
uh, when they came out, number one in 2012, at two gigaflops per watt. And you can see that, you know, the nearest competitor was themselves, okay, in 2011. And then it was, you know, really twice as good as anything else available at the time. Today it's number 48. That is how energy efficient we've gotten in the last two and a half years, because this is November of, this is from November of 2014 that we're number 48. The best is 5.7 gigaflops per watt, and it's using um, accelerators. And what accelerators do is give you a whole bunch of gigaflops <laughs> without a lot of watts. So that's, that's uh, why this has fallen off. Graph 500. The graph 500 is a way of looking really at integer operations rather than floating point operations. And they look at the number of edges in a graph that you can traverse how quickly. Okay, how many you know, edge traversals per second. It was number one in 2012 and it's still number one today. And the claim that IBM makes is this, you know, this shows that this is a great machine for data analytics. Okay, for just straight searching. Uh, not just not just crunching big floating point operations in a simulation. All right, so it's still phenomenally uh, faster than anything else, and it's 6.7 times faster today than it was in 2012. And part of the reason for that is that that was not done on the full machine in 2012. So it's not that it's actually faster. It's just we ran a bigger calculation. They didn't need to run a big calculation in 2012 to be incredibly faster than everyone else. So m many of the integration challenges that we faced on Sequoia had to do with just putting in the infrastructure to support the beast, okay? And part of that infrastructure is this water system. It's liquid cooled. We haven't had a liquid cooled machine since the Cray's in the 80s. I think it was the last thing we had was a Cray YMP in 1982 or something. And they had little self-contained cooling distribution units. They didn't have some huge uh, 4,500 gallon closed loop cooling system, which was what Sequoia has. And this is in our, you know, I told you 17 feet below the floor is where all this stuff is. Well, this cooling unit is underneath the room. It's on the first floor and the room itself, that's 48,000 square feet, is on the second floor. Uh, these are our, this is our special water stuff, special water pipe, polypropylene, and then our custom designed PDUs. The PDUs reduce the underfloor infrastructure by about four times. Uh, we have an incredible electrical engineer named Anna Maria Bailey who designed that PDU. And the, the polypropylene saved us a couple of million dollars. They wanted us to do stainless steel pipe and we did polypropylene instead after they assured uh, themselves and us that it wouldn't foul the water. Okay, you don't want any weird stuff getting in your water and you'll see why later in my talk. And the racks themselves weigh 4,000, 4,500 pounds, okay, which is the same as about 30 elephants when you put that computer on the floor, and it requires special stands to hold them. And many problems. Now I'm going to talk to you about the problems. <coughs> Two days before the stands are supposed to ship, and the stands go in first. That's the first thing we do, put in the stands, and it's, it's like, I don't know. November 1st at this point, and I'm planning on racks powered on January 4th. So let's get the stands in. Two days before, Anna Maria, my friend, comes to me and says, bad news, the planning guide that IBM gave us said 2,500 pounds. These racks are like 4,500 pounds. What happened? Well, they had to redesign this card and it added a lot of weight, okay, during the, after they wrote the planning guide. Uh, you know, the things weren't working, so they added stuff. Well, it got heavier. They forgot to account for the water. You know, these people just write these planning, people like you and me write these planning guides, they make mistakes. They forgot the covers on the machine. It was a lot they forgot. It wasn't so good. I know the guy, he's a great guy. <laughs> it's kind of a bummer. Uh, and they were updating their internal documentation. They just didn't update the documentation that they'd given us. All right, they knew these racks weighed more. We didn't know. So we had to stop the shipment on the racks because we had about 20% contingency in there, not that much contingency, and build and redesign the supports. Had to put in crossbars on these racks so that they'd be right. Okay, fine. Now, two weeks delay, not a big deal. Here come the racks. 
All right, next thing. We've done all the chemistry for this water and that we're going to put through the closed loop system. With a we have two water supplies at the lab, Hetch Hetchy and Zone 7. And Hetch Hetchy is San Francisco water. It's the good stuff. That's what we figured, we figured out that was better. We got a notice, two weeks notice, in November. We're going to do that. By the way, on December 4th, you're got, you guys will be using Zone 7 for about six or seven weeks because we're doing an underground aqueduct somewhere on the way to San Francisco. And so we're going to have to cut off the Hetch Hetchy water supply to you guys. Well, that's a huge problem for us because we have to quick fill up this huge retention basin with Hetch Hetchy so we can use that. And we used to have big pipes like this that would have filled our guy, but now we've got to come from that little retention basin, which is like this big. So big problems for us. And they thought, no big deal. You guys have a redundant water supply. What's your problem? So the next thing is, in December, they get all this done. They're filling the, the loop with a, from a pipe this big instead of a pipe this big, but they're doing it. And the very last thing you do before you commission your water before you commission your water system is you put a sock, one of these little things, over the filter, all right, and you look at what's on that sock and you make sure that all the little green and blue threads from the pipe are out of there. You know, you've caught all the sediment. You don't want sediment going through the tiny little these tiny little guys, right? Can't get that happening, or you'll clog these up and you won't get the water to come in and out the right way. So you gotta get all the sediment out of there. You gotta make sure there's nothing there. Well, you see the funny color of these, funny color on these things. None of them are really the white that they were when they went into the thing. And no one can figure it out. What in the world's going on? So they agitate it, they empty it, they fill it. They don't tell me for at least 10 days that we have a problem because they're sure they're gonna solve it any minute. I happened to go down to the basement and I see these socks all over the floor. And I said, what's going on? You know, and I'm realizing I, you cannot turn on a rack until you have water to it because that's the way you cool it. Well, make a long story short, there are these big pumps and the vendor of these pumps has oversprayed the inside of the, of the pump. And so what's coming off in the water is paint, paint chips, paint. Gosh, so we have to turn the whole thing off, get our guys down there with wire brushes, and, and make it look like that. Okay, so we did. And then we commissioned the water system and everything, then we got to move on to the actual computer. And there were a lot of problems. I told you about this problem with the, with the cards getting hot. Uh, we also had bent pins on node cards because it turns out if you look at that bottom of that thing and you see those pins, it's real easy to bend them. Okay, and there are no pin guides on this machine. And it was a lot of training to figure out how to not bend pins when you put in these cards. So that was a little issue that we dealt with. Uh, water quality, I'll tell, tell not, this, not that water quality, different water quality. Uh, we had a bulk power module load sharing issue that they fixed and redid the power supplies. We had these little gaskets, these EMI gaskets that sit on the edge of the power supplies and they're just little things that a lot of parts have, little rubber things. Well, they were falling off. You can't have them fall off. Then your UL certification and all your safety stuff doesn't stand up anymore. So they had to turn off every blue jean Q rack in the world. And they're in Germany and England and Livermore and Chicago and go out and have teams deployed to basically come out and re-glue on all these little EMI gaskets to every existing rack. Now we didn't have 96 racks at the time. We had, I don't know, 20. So 20 racks worth of EMI gaskets. It was a pain. <coughs> cooling monitor issues. Big time cooling monitor issues. What does the cooling monitor do if it thinks, well, it, t it looks at flow. Flow in and flow out. If flow in and flow out don't match by a pretty close margin, it shuts the rack off because it says you got a leak. These things were just tripping like bad dogs. We actually had to turn off slow leak detection in this machine to, to get it to run calculations, to get it to run a LINPAC, to get it to be the fastest machine in the world. We said, okay, 
we have sensor ribbon in the floor that detects water and it's worked once when we had a little leak down from one of our inlet pipes one of our pipes not the not the machine it set off an alarm in our ops area so forget about this slow leak detection because it's a piece of junk uh, and they had to rework it but the biggest issue of all and the one that was that delayed the acceptance of the machine and probably caused us the most heartache when it came to trying to be number one uh, it took 26 hours to run a full machine when pack on this machine and Super computing's July it was started June 16th. We have to have your result in by the Friday before that. That was a Monday. So you had to have your result in by the Friday before it. We started running Limpacks in late April when we got the machine integrated. And they would get to varying places in the calculation before the machine would, before we'd lose a note card, right? A compute card, like the thing you guys have seen. Um, you know, first it's these hot ones. So we solved that problem. Then it's the bent pins. Well, we solved that problem. But now it's the memory controller. The memory controller keeps croaking. And we think it's just a memory issue. The miracle of all miracles is that we ran our very last, the very last LINPAC that we could possibly get in before the deadline on submitting the number. And that is the first time and only time that we got a complete system LINPAC on that machine before, for six months later. Okay, only time we got it to go 26 hours without losing a card was that Friday morning that we had to res report the result at 10 a.m. We had a 26 hour LINPAC finish at 16.7 teraflop, uh, petaflops and reported it and got number one. It took us until August, five minutes? Ten. 10 minutes. It took us until August to find the fact that during their quality, they had gotten a second manufacturer because they were behind. The second manufacturer got spun up. One of their quality tests at the very end of putting together these compute cards is to put a little weight on the board, stress it, and then you know pop it out the other side. That machine got out of alignment. So it wasn't putting an even stress on the board. It was putting an uneven stress on the board. It was cracking, microscopically cracking the chip. Well, I told you we ran Linpack zillions of times, right? You run hot. Stop running cold, hot, cold, hot, cold, hot, cold, thermocycling. So these cracks are getting bigger. You inject dye under one of these chips, okay? And if the dye comes up, it means you got a crack. If you can see the dye, you got a crack. We had 24,000 cracked, okay? That's a lot of cracks. That's a lot of cracked boards. Uh, we accepted the machine three months late and we have lifetime warranty on our boards and they're actually reflowing the solder on the boards to get rid of the to get rid of the microscopic cracks so that that's a really cool thing to learn because it's nothing like anything else we had some water quality issues okay wasn't that big a deal we fixed them we have a chemist they come in every month they treat the water no more water quality issues oh no 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 i want to show you uh, four months sped up into less than a minute. I think I do. This is, this is the building of this machine from January to April of 2012. And this is really, you know, this is only the machine part. All, I have another video that shows you all the water and all the electrical and all that stuff getting built. And it's, you know, it's just as cool to see. But we have limited time. You get the general idea. It goes on and on. <laughs> and uh, you can see, you see, you see the looped fiber there in the front. So this picture is, you know, before we actually were finished, but we had some bad fiber and we ran a good one and we just looped it over the top because we needed to run. We couldn't, you know, mess around getting under the floor. All right. What do you get out of these machines? Uh, a lot of very cool stuff. Drug design, 
traumatic brain injury studies, machine gun suppressor technology. These are the ones you know I like I like to talk about because I, I kind of understand them. Uh, this one is, a, is, is the very first application that was run on Sequoia. It was on the unclassified side. We run it on the class. We run classified applications on Sequoia now, so they aren't they aren't electrophysiology of the heart studies. But this is a way of looking at heart arrhythmias, and what running on Sequoia enabled them to do was look at hundreds of heartbeats for a particular arrhythmia drug rather than ten heartbeats. And with ten heartbeats, you can't tell that this arrhythmia drug actually causes arrhythmia. All right. Uh, but with hundreds of heartbeats, you can. And that is the kind of thing, that's the reason why high performance computing is such a great thing. Because you can really understand the way things work. What else? There's a guy, at, uh, I had to go, I got to go, I shouldn't say I had to, got to go to Washington and to the Senate and one of their little halls and sit in front of this board and talk to the uh, Secretary of Energy. And what I talked to him about was traumatic brain injury research and machine gun suppressor research. Very quickly, a guy I know was asked to say, hey, are our army hel helmets as good as the football helmets when it comes to traumatic brain injury? And it, actually, they are. There's different kind of shock you get from a bomb than you get from being hit, okay? Uh, but what he did find out was those helmets would be optimal if you made them a little bit thicker and a little bit bigger. And he gave that input to, to, the, to the Army because they paid him, us, to do work for others. All right? And we used our additive manufacturing, which is 3D printing, to make the pads and to, to actually manufacture the pads that would be optimal. The other thing he did, which I just love, is uh, designed a suppressor to enable soldiers who are over fighting to hear each other when they're shooting, okay? One thing, they get ear damage, but the other thing is they can't talk to each other. They can't hear a dang thing anybody's saying. And they come home and they can't hear at all. Uh, bad. The other problem is at night, you can see where they are because there's this big flash. So we want as little flash as possible, and we want these things so that people can talk to each other. And he designed one that does exactly that. And he did it using high performance machines. And, and I asked him if I could take that thing to Washington. And he said, only if I had a general with me. So it's a big darn deal that we have this thing. All right? And you're not, you're not seeing those flashes anymore when people shoot machine guns in, in the dark. And it's because he was able to do very quickly, turn something around, and then build it using our, using our 3D printer at Livermore. It's pretty cool. All right, this is, this is a good slide. I don't have a lot of time. It says, look, this is the way the architecture was in 1995. You had memory and you had a CPU. This is, a, this is the way Sequoia is. You have shared memory and a bunch of cores that can get to this shared memory. This is the way accelerators are today, Titan and Oak Ridge, <coughs> which is this kind of a model, which is a PCI bus attached to an accelerator with its own memory and cores attached to their memory. And the big issue is this slow bus. Now, where are we going? Low power cores and non-uniform memory accesses. Still a slow PCI bus. Memory hierarchies. Far memory, fast memory, right? SSD. So you have your fast memory, your RAM, and then you have your SSD, solid state device, and that's your far slow memory. And in general, you're going over a slow PCI bus. Where are we going? We're going to processor in memory. Trying to reduce the latencies. Trying to get the memory bandwidth not to be the issue it is today. You've got all these cores and lousy memory bandwidth. It, you know, it's not helpful. So I, I've alluded to this. The age of easy HPC gains is over. Am I at five minutes? Two minutes. All right. I will always bring a watch from here on out. Um, all right. Why, why are the age of easy HPC gains over? Because I, because 
power wall plus memory wall plus the instruction level parallelism wall is the brick wall. Uh, David Patterson wrote, wrote about this, and we are running into it you know, right now. And the kinds of things I'm being asked to do at work, which you know, I'm like, how do I know? Uh, <laughs> What are we going to do after five nanometer technology? You know, I want you to, to research neuromorphic computing and quantum computing. And, you know, I get on, like you, you know, I go out to Wikipedia and I'm like, what the heck is it? <laughs> you know? So I'm trying to figure it out. Uh, but that's where we are. You know, we're, we're going to these, to these deep memory hierarchies and we're trying to deal with the fact that you just can't keep cramming. The, the transistors in, into the silicon. DOE has a plan to deploy machines. Uh, advanced technology systems, commodity technology systems. We're getting one in 2017 at Livermore. It was a, it's a collaboration with two other national labs. The collaboration is called Coral. That's a procurement, not a machine. The machine is Sierra. It will be six times faster than Sequoia minimum. It will have 2.7 petabytes of local memory. Uh, 120 petabytes file system sitting out in front of it. It will also have, uh, you know, SSDs. Okay, it will it will have SSDs. So there will be several memory hierarchies which we do not use today on Sequoia. We will get this machine. Truthfully, we will get this machine probably around uh, January of 2018 is when I think it'll actually arrive. And this is the machine I would love to talk to you about. Uh, unfortunately, you know, IBM won't even t let me tell you the processor that's on the machine, and I think you can actually find it on the internet, so go out there and look. <laughs> the country is investing in, in high performance computing research uh, with, through the Office of Science mostly, all right, with fast forwards and path forwards, and they're investing money into, into vendors to get them to do figure out what comes next and help fund what comes next, okay? So silicon photonics, stacked memory, those kinds of uh, technologies we need to move us forward toward the exascale and solving uh, the problems of our day faster, accelerating the pace of scientific discovery, which is what high performance computing enables. Last slide. Uh, the lab's a great place to work if, you, if you're interested in the computing challenges, software, hardware, uh, facilities, all of it. Uh, Sequoia was a great ride, and it's still doing really well for, uh, for science. And we have lots of challenges moving forward. Okay. Questions? Yes. So um, people are giving a pet more and more cores on a chip. Yes. It's almost two dimensional now and how thin they are. Yes. Is one way to uh, put more in there and make it three dimensional, like a cube almost? I so think I think people are looking at that. I think that instead of I think that's what they're looking at for memory. I haven't I have not personally seen three dimensional um, packing cores in three dimensions because I, I'm not sure you can handle the electrical how do they deal with like the heat escape for that? Because that's like what's trapped in the cube, right? Yeah, yeah. For for memory? Yeah. Oh well, I think they're looking at actually having cooling technology built into the memory. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So for Sierra, you said that they're gonna have uh, rotating disk storage and solid state drives. Yes, the rotating disk will be off system. Okay. Yes, okay. high speed network attached. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, definitely not inside. No, no, no. We're at, we're, we no, no, we don't like any hard drives in our systems. They're too prone to failure and crummy. Yes. The compute card has a Made in China sticker on it. Would you comment on what part? <laughs> no, I won't. <laughs> I, don't, I, I don't know the answer. I don't know the answer to definitely not final assembly. That's Poughkeepsie, New York, for the good manufacturer. Well, thank you again. You bet.